you know how this presentation go. I, I should be showing you a picture of me as a kid with a, an astronaut's helmet and tell you that I always wanted to be um, an astronaut. But that wasn't the case. I do have a history with space that started when I was very young. <laughs> I, I was asked uh, to repel an alien invasion. I was nine. <laughs> I had a, um, a small computer, uh, Timex Sinclair 2068. And um, my motor coordination has always been quite bad. So in that era, you had to put a cassette and then you played with the, with the screwdriver and the azimuth for like 15 minutes and then load the game, and then I will start playing and lose in like 10 seconds, and then I have to do the whole thing all over again, right? And it wasn't for me, I tried and I couldn't get better at it. So what I decided to do is I, I, I figured, I had three lives, but that number was somewhere in there in the computer, so if somehow I could figure out what the number was, and I could go in there and change that number, then suddenly I could have many more lives to try to play this game, and that's what I did. I started poking and peeking into the computer's memory until I found the place where that three was stored. I could change that three for 100 and for 150, for 255, for some reason no more than that. And I started wondering <laughs> why. And uh, my life has been a continuation of the same thing. I mean, I've been essentially doing exactly that for all of my life, basically hacking into things, peeking and poking inside for different generations of computer that got more and more complex. And the good thing about Moore's law is sort of a side effect of Moore's law, but if you keep your hacking abilities pretty much constant, then the impact you can get by hacking actually grows exponentially. <laughs> <laughs> and that, so, so I tried to keep pretty much the same ability, but went to hack uh, uh, larger and larger computers. I did that for a while for fun and also for profit. I started a few software companies, mostly in information security. That was my um, area of expertise as a teenager. Um, <laughs> and, um, uh, and a few years ago, I found myself a little bit by chance uh, in this desert over here. This is the back view from NASA Ames uh, Research Center that NASA has in Mountain View in California. And I found myself there. Uh, I was trying to um, talk to smart people about what they were doing. I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life um, in 2010 after I transitioned out from my latest company. Uh, and what happened there is started to look for the first time at how people were building things that were going to space, like real space technology, you know, satellites and spaceships. And I was really surprised. I was really surprised because I come from a completely different background, you know. I grew up in Argentina, as I mentioned. In Argentina, you didn't dream of being a space uh, technologist or, you know, an astronaut because, you know, those things happened somewhere else, basically. <laughs> um, so I was really surprised. I had this exposition to people that were building the things that were really surprised. In my mind, you know, space technology was like this. You know, it should be like this super cutting edge, innovative thing full of like sci-fi dreams. And when you look at the, the reality of it, it actually looks a lot more like this. And this is awesome in a sense. I mean, if you look at, this is the view outside of the uh, space shuttle, right? And if you, look the, I mean, if, you, if you look outside the window, the view is amazing. You have the curvature of the Earth, you know, the stars, uh, it's pretty cool, right? But if you look at the, if you're a technologist then you look at the panels there, right? You start asking yourself, is it, I mean, are we really flying, you know, green phosphorus monitors to space? Like, why? I mean, we haven't used those on Earth for decades, I don't know. And, and you start looking inside those panels and actually, you know, what's in, what was inside the, the, the space shuttle? It was a modified version of a System 360 from IBM, actually five of those, pretty much this, right? <laughs> so here we were in the 21st century flying technology from the Apollo era, um, and I started wondering why, you know, why is that the case? Why, why did that happen? Um, space technology and IT have a shared origin. Both uh, industries started as post-war industries, right? This is things that we learned to do during Second World War. Um, and, and then they started, we started developing this technology right after the war. So if we go back to 1957, 1958, 1957 is, this is Sputnik, the first artificial satellite launched from the Soviet Union. And 1958, this is the first integrated circuit, right? Coming out of Bell Labs. The origins are pretty close. And in the next 11 years, something amazing happened, right? 
we went from the first satellite in orbit to this. We put a man on the moon, right? <laughs> so, the, it's, but it's really amazing, right? In 11 years, we went from putting the first artificial satellite to putting um, a man on the moon. I was scared because <clears throat> I read that David introduced me for somewhere at, as a space pioneer. I was scared that Buzz Aldrin would come to the station and beat the crap out of me because of that. Because these guys were pioneers, right? This is, it's, it's incredible what they did in 11 years, right? And if you look at the evolution of IT in the same 11 years, we went from the first integrated circuit to the first four computers, and this is actually 69, it's the same year as we put the man on the moon, the first four computers interconnected, um, uh, in this case, in the United States. This was ARPANET, the initial version of what today is. Uh, the internet, a lot of the protocols that run the thing are the same protocols that are actually interconnecting our phones today. And it's pretty cool, right? First satellite to a man on the moon, first integrated circuit, first four computers connected on a network. So my question is what happened then, right? I mean, why did the IT industry went from four interconnected computers in 1969 to a few billion connected devices today, and we're still pretty much doing the same thing that, we've been doing, that we were doing in 1969. Actually, we lost the ability to send people to the moon in the process. So I started to ask myself, why? I mean, why, why is that the case? Why does it have to be the case? And when you ask, like, there's a few different answers to that question, but there's one that struck me um, significantly, which is the main thing of a, a very, like, the, and it's a story that's been told uh, uh, quite often, you know, the story of what happened with the IT industry, with computer revolution. How did we go from this to what we have today? Um, and I think it all started with toys. That's the way I think about it. This is the Altair 8800. This was the first kit that you could buy over mail and they will send it to your house and you will assemble it. And this was essentially um, a predecessor of comp computers. And you could do pretty much nothing with it. Um, uh, when I, I remember when I was a kid, I got my first computer. People would say, OK, you should get a computer. And you asked why. And there weren't really good answers to that question, right? People said they wanted to keep, they wanted to keep their right, cooking recipes in the computers and things like that. But there weren't really like really, really good answers to those questions. But what happened is some people saw in these toys an amazing opportunity. It's these people, these uh, visionaries, these hackers, these entrepreneurs took these toys and transformed them into something that today every one of us has in our pockets, but actually that changed not only um, so not only created an, an industry that's you know, really, really big, but also changed society and changed and impacted positively the lives of billions and billions of people. And this idea that the appropriation of uh, this post-war technology computers by amateurs, by hackers, and by visionaries like this was what created the IT industry that we have today really, really struck me because nothing similar happened with the space industry. And that's one of the reasons that I think uh, differentiate both things. So if I could put a title to my talk, it would be called Hacking Space. I think we are at the point in time right now where we can actually do what those guys did for the IT industry for space. And, I, and I'll tell you a few stories and I'll tell you what we're doing about it. This thing that you see here, it's pretty similar to what we were looking at outside of the window of, of the space shuttle, right? You see the curvature of the Earth, you see the black of space. This was taken by a group of amateurs that uh, put a ca small camera on a, on, a, on, a, on a balloon, okay? The whole project, and they took this balloon to 35 kilometers in altitude, they took those pictures. The whole project cost $150. Um, any one of you can build it. It's helium. The same balloons are used and have been used to prototype and test small satellites, satellites this size. This is actually uh, a CubeSat, a small satellite. This in particular is called a PhoneSat. This was built by a team of people at uh, Ames. Uh, and the computer that runs this satellite is actually a Nexus One phone. 
that you can barely see, but it's there, like stuck diagonally there. And the interesting thing about the satellite is built with off-the-shelf parts. You see that yellow thing that looks like a measuring tape? It's a measuring tape. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the satellite's antenna, OK? Uh, and it's re a measuring tape is really good because it has like a mechanical memory. So you, you, know, you cut it loose, and it springs out to the same position. So it's used as, a, as an antenna. It's a deployable antenna. Uh, and these things actually, um, this, these cubes were built initially as toys. Initially, they were built actually by university professors that wanted to teach their students how to build satellites. And the problem with satellites is it takes 10 years, typically, to build a satellite from idea to finished thing. Um, in the, if you do it traditionally. And if you have to teach students how to build satellites, you only have a semester. So it's really hard to teach people how to do that. So they came up with this idea. It was, maybe we can build something like a model scale of a satellite that has a lot of the same functions, but we can do it in a semester. And they built this, uh, these things that were called CubeSats. And after they built like a couple of thousands of these things in schools in different places, they figured maybe we can put them in space. I mean, because they, they are satellites, right? They're designed to do all these things. So they started putting these things out. Uh, and it turned out that, you know, they were short-lived. There were a lot of problems with them. Nobody knew exactly what they were good for. Um, and, uh, but, you know, the, you could still do some things. This is a really interesting project that came out uh, a couple of years ago. This thing there is a satellite. Um, those uh, small diodes are the solar cells. There's a microcontroller that doubles on the radio. Those two blue cables are actually the antennas. Uh, and those capacitors there play the role of batteries. This thing um, you can build and put in space for in the order of $300. It's, pr it's pretty much a Sputnik. It does exactly the same thing that Sputnik did, right? Just beep, beep. Like, exactly the same thing. <laughs> But it costs $300, right? And you can do it in your garage uh, in a day, which, is, which to me is pretty amazing. So what I started to realize is that we were at a, at a tipping point in, uh, in technology development where we had the tools to build things that could go to space and do real things. And if you talk to the traditional space companies and space stations, they would tell you, ah, these are toys, these are worthless, but, you know, there, there's nothing you can do. But we, we heard that story before, right? the story about the toys. So I decided to uh, start Satellogic with this idea, with the idea that if we somehow could replace this monolithic pieces of hardware that took 10 years to build and cost hundreds of millions of dollars to build with a network of inexpensive components that we can put in space that connect to one another, we can still have a very reliable system and a very reliable platform to provide services from space. It doesn't matter that each of the components fails. It doesn't, I mean, they're designed so that they can fail, and they will fail often. But even if the individual components fail, the system as a whole will still be reliable, and we will still be able to provide services from there. And that's the basic idea with which I started in 2010. Since then, we built all the technology that we need to realize that vision. This was the first night that this idea occurred to me. This is what I draw. And it's pretty much a blueprint of what we did since then. Um, we built uh, three satellites already. This was our first satellite. It's based on the CubeSat design. It's uh, like two cubes, one on top of the other. We used it to try some of the components that we built. This is our, an internal view of our second satellite that we put in space. The first one we put in space in April 2013. We launched it from China. This one we put in space in November uh, 2013. We launched it from Russia. It hang, it, this one already has a camera, camera electronics. Um, high, high bit reconnection, um, an onboard computer of our design. A lot of the components that we will need for a third satellite that we put in space um, two months ago. Uh, and this satellite, it's a little bit bigger. It's 25 kilograms, pretty much the size of an old desktop PC. Um, it can take high resolution imaging and do high resolution video from space. And instead of costing $350 million to build and launch like a traditional high resolution imaging satellite, it costs in the order of $300,000 to build and launch. So we can 
put these things in space for one thousandth of the cost of the traditional satellite and still do a lot of the same things. Will they live there for 15 years and work flawlessly? Probably not. But we can put so many of them out there that it doesn't matter. Today we have three. The vision is to put 300 of these things out there. And when we have 300 of them, they actually form a mesh network. They talk to one another. We have distributed storage. We have distributed computing. We have the possibility of providing completely new services from space. And in particular, we have, because we have so many satellites, what happens with satellites in low Earth orbit is there's, they're going around pretty fast. Each of our satellites is going at you know, 27,000 kilometers an hour. So it's pretty fast. One orbit around the Earth every 90 minutes. If we put 300 of them, what happens is we have satellites close to any point on the Earth pretty much all the time. So with a constellation like this, we can actually go for real-time imaging and real-time video in high resolution of anywhere on the planet. And that's the vision. Why? Because I think that if we look at the, some of the biggest problems that we face as a society in the next 20 years, this is the way I think about it. We have food production and distribution, which is going to be a huge issue when we have to feed 10 billion people in the next 20 years. We have energy generation and distribution, and we have natural resources, and in particular, water. And we have problems about how we manage all those things. But in particular, what happens is that there's a lot of trade-offs there. I mean, if you have water, you can produce food. If you have biomass, you can produce energy. If you have energy, you can actually produce consumable water. So there's a lot of trade-offs there. And we have to make decisions on a daily basis about those trade-offs. And the way we've been doing that so far has been, if we want to be really nice about it, uh, you know, with some heuristics. <laughs> Not to say that we have no idea what we're doing, which is probably the case. And so my thesis is that for us to be able to fit 10 billion people in the next 20 years, and for us to be able to have a more sustainable society, and for us to be able to take care of our planet, we, we need to be able to make decisions about these trade-offs based on data and not based on you know, hand-waving and uh, heuristics. Uh, and how will you collect data on global processes on real time, if not with a satellite network? Right? So that's what we're doing. Uh, there are other things that you could do. I mean, you can imagine all the different applications of being able to look at any place on the world in real time, just being able to put a finger in the map and looking in high resolution at what's going on there. So from monitoring biomass in, you know, in a, on a daily basis to monitoring critical infrastructure to monitoring social conflict or the health of the planet, these are some of the things that we will be able to do with this platform. But I'm, I'm trying to let you in on a small secret, actually, which is the barriers to create, build, launch, and operate spaceships have fallen. And few people have realized this, but you know, now you know. <laughs> so it doesn't matter if you want to monitor the Earth, or you want to mine asteroids, or you want to uh, send robots to the moon, or you want to explore the solar system, or you decide that the best chance that we have to survive as a species is to buck up our biosphere in a different planet. It doesn't matter. What matters is that now you have the ability to take this technology and build the things and try to grab for yourself the mission of transcending planet Earth and going into the cosmos. So thank you. <laughs> Amazing ambition, Emiliano. Um, but just as Anne has found with 23andMe, when you take a big, ambitious new project, sometimes you hit regulators. Surely it can't just be as simple as we're going to launch 300 satellites into space and nobody's going to say, hang on. Well, the interesting thing about uh, uh, low Earth orbit is uh, it's actually not regulated um, today. Um, so if you launch and you put something in space, it's uh, essentially there. Um, you have to register your satellites with the UN. There's a registry of uh, objects that go to extraterrestrial space. I think that's the, the actual name of it. Um, but it's just a register. Um, for sure, uh, it, it's been an industry that's been, in a sense, self-regulated because there's only a few nations in the world that have the ability to put things in space. So there's probably 10, ten countries that have uh, rockets. Um, 
as I mentioned, some of these uh, barriers are falling down, and now you know anybody in this room can build their own satellite and pretty much find a uh, rocket to put it in space. So it's probable that at some point in the future this will have to be regulated, but today it's pretty much like the Wild West. Right? I guess you go there, put the, the satellite. Of, the risk of space junk. Well, or satellites deorbit uh, ne automatically, or deorbit naturally after three years, and they crash back into the atmosphere and disintegrate completely on reentry, so we're not generating any any debris, any sustainable debris. And so the best bad practice in the, in, in, you know, in the industry, but this is something that's been sort of a gentleman's agreement, is that you will build satellites that will be there for at most 20, 25 years, and then either deorbit or, or put them in a parking orbit where they don't uh, bother anybody. But, uh, and what's been the hardest thing so far in trying to build this ambitious mission? Taking it slowly, taking it step by step, you know, um, going, I mean, we won't go from zero to 300 satellites in space in a day. Um, it's taking us uh, three years to develop all the technology that we need to realize the vision. And we're now pacing it in a way that, you know, we're, we're scaling up this constellation along with customers. So we're launching 15 satellites next year um, and growing from there to the, to the vision of real-time imaging. How many up at the moment? Three. Three. And 15 more 15 next, next year. year. Yeah. Wow. Emiliano Cargiman, thank you. Great.